Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dark Slide. In each episode of The Dark Slide, I talk shop with fellow photographers and get them to let us in on our photographic journeys and how they got to where they are today. I'm your host, Tim French, and you can find my photography on my Instagram, which is at photos by Tim French. Today in the dark slide, I talk with a photographer who is so accomplished that to cover everything they've done in an interview that's an hour and change is simply impossible. That said, we did manage to cover quite a bit. Some things we covered include the production of HKPM, their introduction to Kowloon Walled City and what it was like to photograph it, the balance between making photos for magazines and their own personal projects, and how their photo book, Phantom Shanghai, came to fruition. So, without further ado, let's jump into my full conversation with photographer Greg Gerard. Hi, Greg. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. It's such an honor and a treat to have you on the podcast, so thank you for being here and taking the time. Sure. Very, very happy to be here. So you grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, and started making photos in the early 70s. What, right. were, what were you shooting, and how much of an impact did your hometown have on your work? I was shooting with um, a Canon uh, SLR, um, kind of the entry-level um, camera. So I think it was called a TLB, and um, you know, I worked a part-time job and saved money and bought one of those. It was around... Uh, Hundred and sixty dollars new, um, and um, I mean the city had a pretty big impact on me. I grew up just outside of Vancouver, so actually going into town to downtown Vancouver was a pretty big journey in its own way. You know, young kid living in the kind of suburbs and going into town so that was that was an adventure in itself and i think a lot of what those early pictures are about is me just sort of exploring this this other world so it was around that time in vancouver that you began making photos that would appear in your book under vancouver mm -hmm, right did you have the foresight when making those photos to know that they were going to be in the book no i mean you know as a young person i don't think you think in terms of what's going to happen a whole lot into the future you know i was very much concerned with the moment in the sense of the adventure of making pictures and getting to know the city and getting to know the kinds of people that were living there and you know having having the camera was kind of the license or the excuse to go exploring. Um, I'm certainly not the first person to say anything like that, but that was absolutely the truth for me was I ended up doing things I, I wouldn't have done if I hadn't picked up a camera. Was anyone in your family um, into photography? I mean, my dad had a, a camera for doing family snaps and that kind of thing, and that was the first camera I ever used. Um, so I, I guess you could say yes, but not in terms of going out into the world with the camera. It was more about making pictures of family and family-related stuff. What was the photography scene like in Vancouver at the time? Um, were there a uh, lot of local photographers around who were showing their work? And if so, was there a particular photographer whose work spoke to you? No. I mean, I, if there was a scene, I, I didn't know anything about it. I mean... Um, this would have been early 70s, and um, later in the 70s, I think there was uh, a photography gallery that opened, and it was around for a few years, but by that point, I was already living abroad, so I was later aware of that, but I, mean, I didn't know any other photographers or anything like that. Um, the I mean the the pictures one was surrounded by were things in magazines and you know the visual sort of landscape that you'd see on billboards or te you know television screens I mean photography was 
not something that was around in the same way it is today. It was a real kind of niche. And I guess you could argue photography is still a niche in some ways. It's just mm-hmm. become so ubiquitous with, with the way we can all make pictures now. I mean, there was a kind of a, you know, a certain a craft element to getting pictures made until quite recently, really, you know, you had to learn how to expose film properly and um, decide whether to shoot in black and white or color or color print or color slide. And, you know, there were all these decisions and choices you'd have to make to get whatever you're trying to get or to imitate whoever you're trying to imitate and learn from. Um, so, I mean, all these, all these things played a kind of a role in, 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 you know, me starting to make pictures and the things I was starting to become aware of. Mm. And you're a self-taught photographer. Right. Yeah. So was there ever a time during the self-teaching stage when you came across some aspect or element that you just couldn't figure out and which kind of led you to questioning whether, whether photography was for you? Um, I knew it was for me, I think, pretty early on. I just didn't know whether I'd ever figure out any any way to make a living from it. I mean, that seems so far-fetched. Um, I mean, I should back up for a second and say that in high school, uh, I took a course um, where uh, the the teacher was a pretty dedicated photographer and uh, learned how to develop film and print uh in in a classic dark room so i can't say that i didn't have any formal education but it was it was in high school i i I learned that and i guess in terms of community that was my first sense that there were other people out there interested in photography but um that was the last year of high school and then i kind of went off by myself traveling and whatnot um you know, in those days, the you know, being exposed to photography was really kind of in popular magazines, um, the library, I mean, the books in the library related to photography were from the 50s and before, you know, there was very little kind of contemporary stuff around. And, and, that's, and again, that's why magazines played such a big role. It was all kind of back in the day when magazines had more impact than they they do today. So things like popular photography or modern photography, you know, you'd have um, kind of tech tips about lenses and cameras and filters and processing techniques for film, etc. But there'd also be in among the ads and these kind of tech related things, there'd be portfolios by contemporary photographers of the day. And, that was where you really saw kind of the the people working in the medium who were being published or exhibited, not really in where I was living, but you know in in the wider world or let's say in the, in, in New York, um, perhaps in Europe. So people like Lee Friedlander or Diane Arbus or Gary Winogrand, people like that. Um, you know, that's where I became aware of the work of, of other photographers was through these popular magazines and th- because that's pretty much all there was mm. um, you know there weren't there, there wasn't really a, a lot dedica- dedicated to photography outside of kind of the consumer the consumer market I guess you'd say so what inspired you to get into photography I mean I think it was really a picture in a magazine Um you know, you'd, I'd be looking at these photography magazines in, you know, in the drugstore and they'd have, um, you know, portfolios by people and um, these different photographers who are, you know, kind of the gods today. Um, they were mid-career or just starting out back then. And... Um, They'd also publish work by kind of random people, I guess, who sent pictures in or somehow they found these pictures. And um, I mean, it was really, it's, it's really kind of uncanny that, yeah, a, a picture can kind of launch you. But I mean, I think it was, um, it was a picture from maybe 1971 or 72, very kind of in a way, a very simple picture of um, a young woman stepping off 
a curb in this late afternoon sunlight. So very deep shadows in the background and this slashing sunlight across this very anonymous, random street scene, maybe New York, uh, hard to know where it was. And it was just, you know, incredibly beautiful and powerful um, image of this everyday moment. But I think the other thing that that made me understand that this was different was that it took somebody pre-seeing this before it happened to make this picture. So there had to be the anticipation of this, that this was about to happen. Mm. And it sort of, it sort of gave me the idea, I guess, that things, some things don't exist until they're photographed. You know, mm. the world swirls around you, but photography makes you notice it and um and uh and and do something with it so i think it was it was a picture in a magazine kind of random uh that that kind of alerted me to this world of photography and what what it could be so you started making night photos as soon as you more or less as soon as you picked up a camera yeah pretty much i mean when i bought my first camera i think the first thing i did was start making pictures at night with it yeah did that the night photography present much of a learning curve for you very much so yeah um you know slide film is quite it's a great medium but the exposures are critical a little over or under and the picture is kind of unusable so the using slide film you know you're you're spending money and getting bad pictures back so you try to improve quickly because it's ex they're expensive mistakes especially when you're you know you're young and a roll of film and processing films quite a lot of money you use daylight film when capturing your night scenes yeah um i mean i used i used other i mean the, the choice was really tungsten film or daylight film and mm -hmm. tungsten film was was um you know it's balanced for incandescent light so it has a, a blue bias in daytime and that that gives things a particular look um but most mostly yeah i used i used daylight film so were you using daylight film when you first started making photos at night or was that something that you um, delved into later no i mean i i you know daylight film is what comes off the shelf when you you buy a roll of film and mm -hmm. so that it was kind of a little bit later that i started trying other started trying tungsten um but the the blue bias is really quite pronounced and um uh i was and i use i used to use it selectively um i mean later in my in my career as it were but um mo most of it was was daylight film and so anything that's not daylight on the film tends to get a, a, a quite a strong color cast um you know, fluorescent kind of renders as green and uh, incandescent light is yellow. Um, other kinds of street light can go various color temperatures or color palettes. And every daylight film has its own palette. So you'd be getting a certain green on one film and a different green on another. And you know, learning the, the difference between them was part of the part of the journey, as it were. So for listeners out there who aren't familiar with film or just film stocks in general, um, can you inform them as to what daylight film is? Um, daylight film is balanced for sunlight. So that means uh, the, the sun as it appears kind of at midday, it has a certain color temperature, um, typically 5200 kelvin for whatever that's worth and as as the as the day goes on and the the sun sinks into the sky or earlier in the day as the sun rises it's it it has a, a warmer color temperature hence setting sun looks uh, more yellow or orange um and depending on what's in the atmosphere it can go quite strong orange or yellow or even kind of red depending on what other things are affecting the sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's really, it's really just a kind of a neutral look where things are kind of looking natural. 
Um, and, and that's why if you took pictures in the shade with daylight color film, um, they look kind of bluish because um, it's balanced for sunlight. So, I mean, just, just kind of seeing how all that worked, experimenting and seeing what films did what, that was, you know, part of the craft. It used to be a, a, a matter of fact part of the craft was just kind of getting, getting to know the material. Why do you choose to shoot with daylight film in situations where there is very little to no light? Um, I mean, day, again, daylight film is, is what's available and, uh, there, there is no such thing really as a as a night film unless you you consider tungsten, which would have kind of a bluish cast um, to be more night like. So I mean, it's not so much me choosing daylight film; it's just that's what's available. That's what every film by default is. Um, but what you start seeing is what happens under artificial light sources so under street lights under fluorescent lights under a mix of whatever signage might be there uh, under moonlight you know there's you start to kind of become aware of light in a way that you don't at night um daylight is kind of daylight and it falls on everything but when the sun is gone you start noticing these different light sources falling on things so in a way it's not looking at the light it's like it's looking at where the light is coming from and what it's falling on so in a way you're kind of turning your back to the light and looking at what is being illuminated by a street lamp a neon sign a car headlight uh, an open refrigerator door in a darkened apartment at night these are all light sources it's all it's all lighting and um maybe shooting film makes you pay more attention to that because especially with transparency film slide film Mm -hmm. um it has a more saturated look Mm -hmm. and the color cast is perhaps stronger than on negative film Mm -hmm. so um that that became my go-to thing to use was slide film and again remember that um you know with a with a a slide a cardboard mounted piece of transparency film you don't need to make a print you can project it if you have a projector or look at it on a light box or hold it up to a window or a light bulb and and see what's there and typically you'll use a a loop a, a small magnifier to see what's in the image And it's kind of, it sounds incredibly reductive to put all that energy into making a a slide, but it, um, slide film is the most, um, it had higher resolution than um, negative film Mm. back then in 35 mil. Mm. Um, I think things have improved for negative film a lot since, since then, but um, and then later, once I started working professionally, the the magazines mostly preferred slide film um, for doing uh, reproductions in, in magazines, certainly in, in journalism. So in 1982, you moved from Vancouver to Hong Kong. Um, yep. How old were you when you moved to Hong Kong and what prompted the move? Um, in 1982, I guess I would have been 26. Seven, I guess, but I'd visited earlier in the seventies. My 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 first trip there was seventy four, and I was eighteen um, on that first trip. Um, so I discovered that part of the world kind of early, I guess you could say. Um, Nineteen seventy four, I took a freighter from San Francisco to Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and that was my first visit to Hong Kong and that part of the world traveled in Southeast Asia for about eight months um, and made subsequent visits to Hong Kong. But in, in 1982 ended up, ended up living there. I actually went to visit, but fell into a job and a life. And so I ended up living there quite, quite happily. Um, the first four years I, I worked, I ended up working as a sound recordist for 
BBC Television News, part of a Hong Kong-based news crew covering news in the region for domestic British television. And um, that was my kind of on-the-job training, as it were, to learn how to arrive in a situation you may not know a whole lot about, but, you know, within a short matter of time, have a, a set of pictures that sort of describe what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so 1987, I started working professionally as a photographer after three, four years working for the BBC as a sound recordist. And so, at, so it was at that time when you started working for a publication such as National Geographic, Time and Newsweek? Yeah, National Geographic came quite a bit later. Uh, my first first magazine I worked for was something now um, long gone called Asia Week, a, a Hong Kong-based regional news magazine, and then started freelancing for Time and Newsweek and and other most mostly American but also European magazines. Um, National Geographic didn't come till quite a bit later. I was already kind of thinking of getting away from magazine photography when that very welcome invitation came to do some work for them. And uh, so that came in around 2006 or seven. How did you become a photographer for magazines? I mean, I don't think there's any clear, obvious, direct way. Um, like a lot of things in life, it requires kind of knocking on doors, and I wasn't really great at that. Um, I think I could make pictures, but um, it takes another part of your psyche and personality to kind of start cold calling people to try to get your work in front of them. The magazine world back then was... Um, I think it's glory days were already waning, but one could still make a living as a magazine photographer. Um, it, there was some advantage in, in being in Asia at the time. Um, you know, photographs themselves were harder to make, knowing how to make journalistic type photographs that told the story and told the story for a Western audience is probably, probably key as well. And, um, I mean, really it involved calling somebody up, writing a letter, making a phone call, you know, showing them, you know, getting your work in front of people. Um, I mean, these days it's still, I mean, the same thing still goes on. How do you get your work in front of people? I mean, these days you have social media as, a as an option and, uh, you can put it out there, though, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be seen. And the same thing still applies. How do you how do you make your how do you make your work um, uh, get in front of people who can publish it with social media? There's a certain amount of self-publishing to it, but mm -hmm. still you get a you get a big bump when traditional media pays attention. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, really, it was phone calls, uh, letter writing, um, going and dropping off a portfolio, that kind of thing. Back to your visits to Hong Kong um, before you moved there. When you, were, when you were visiting Hong Kong, were you making any photos at that time? Yeah, I was absolutely photographing. Um, I mean, I, I went on my you know, first trip to that part of the world intending to make pictures. I mean, that's, for me, in large part, what it was about was going and going off to take photographs. Mm -hmm. and so, what, yeah. And would any of those photos that you were making at that time, would any of those photos make it into HKPM? Absolutely, yeah. Some of the very first Hong Kong pictures I, I took uh, are in HKPM. And... Um, you know, there were, um, that was 1974, so a couple trips, 74, 75. Um, absolutely, some of those uh, early pictures uh, are in the book. And, um, you know, I mean, there's, it, photography so much is in the editing. So it's about, you know, it's about, of course, getting rid of the bad ones, but then finding the good ones that seem to kind of convey something of 
whatever it is you're you were trying to say about the place or about yourself being there. How long did you live in Hong Kong? I lived in Hong Kong a total of about uh, 14 years, I guess, um, from 82 to 98 with a little break in between. I spent a couple of years in, in New York in the middle of all that. But even though I was living in New York, I was mostly assigned to work in Asia. So I, I had an apartment there, but I wasn't there very much. So what was the transition like? I mean, you know, going from Vancouver more or less from Vancouver to, to Hong Kong. I mean, did it take you a while to acclimate to your new environment? I mean, I can imagine for me, I mean, I'm sure, you know, it would, but how was it for you? I mean, the bigger acclimation was coming back to Vancouver after having lived in Asia for 30 years. Mm. I mean, going, going out and wandering around was, was great fun and an adventure and a sense of kind of, um, this is exactly where I want to be when I, you know, first ended up living in, in Tokyo was the first place I lived overseas and, um, and then later Hong Kong. So those were, those were not, um, not problematic in any way. It was an absolute delight and an adventure and uh, a lot of fun to be doing it. Um, coming back was the hard part. So did you know, uh, I mean, I mean, you had visited prior to your move. So did you make like connections with people living in Hong Kong before you moved there or? Like... No. Um, I mean, I had, I did know somebody there, but, um, and I guess to some extent, I mean, a lot of this you have to understand was never really planned. I was young and wandering around and mm -hmm. things were changing from day to day. So, I mean, I ended up living in Tokyo because I was visiting and I decided to stay and I tried to figure out how to do that. And Hong Kong was a little bit the same in that I was visiting and then the visit turned into an extended visit and then um, I managed to um, fall into a, a job that was interesting. So it wasn't really planned. Um, it, was, it was something that just kind of happened over time. I want to circle back to HKPM for a minute. And uh, for listeners out there who are new to the work of Greg Gerard, HKPM showcases night photos that are made between 1974 and 1986 in Hong Kong. And if you're a fan of night photography, particularly night street scenes with cool cars and neon signs, you should definitely consider putting this book in your collection. It is absolutely amazing. One of my favorite photos from HKPM isn't a night street scene, but rather a photo that was taken inside a bar. The photo is of a lit jukebox in the corner of the bar, and near the jukebox is an empty table and chairs. I'll leave a link in the description for listeners. There's a lot to like about this photo, but what pulls me in the most is the use of color, particularly the pink color of the wall and awesome contrast it has with lit up blue pieces of the front of the jukebox. When capturing a night scene, is the color or color something that you first take into consideration before you photograph it? Um, I know that with a long exposure, like that picture was taken on a tripod inside the bar. And you have to remember that um, transparency film is in the technical parlance, quite slow, uh, unlike digital cameras where you can increase the sensitivity to light up to things you could never even dream of doing with film. So in, in, in the case of that picture, I mean, I was in the bar and I was intending to make pictures that night of the inside of some bar if I could. And um, I went into that one, and it was it was it was taken I think in 1985 that picture, but it was even then it was like going back in time, so it kind of connected to this earlier era of Hong Kong where you know the navies of the world passed through, and um, uh, this part of town was it used to be right on the waterfront, and so it has a history of kind of being a waterfront bar area. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 
so there was there was something of that feeling or of that um that kind of world to me that was still apparent in this bar and 